thank you so much, Prayag and Deepak. Uh, unfortunately, the other um, writers whose books have been uh, shortlisted can't be with us today. Um, but I'm hoping to, you know, sort of structure this uh, conversation in a way that um, allows our readers to make inroads into the books, into both your books, and we'll intersperse the conversation with readings as well, so they get some sense of the book and hopefully manage to pick up the books and get your book signed as well. Okay. So I'm going to start off by attempting a little summary of uh, both the books so you guys get some sense of what the books are about. Well, Temporary People by Deepa Kunikrishnan is a deep and a nuanced documentary of the lives of a series of migrant workers who leave uh, behind their homes um, in search of a life that will feed and fulfill. But amidst these disparate narratives, um, that are familiar, fleeting, fragile in a sense, there is a sort of um, common idea that resonates, the idea of um, home, identity, belonging. Um, and the weight of the word temporary itself, which I thought was perhaps the most significant of the... Um, Prayag Akbar's Leila, on the other hand, I thought was, the, um, was um, really about the idea of search. Uh, a mother's search literally for her daughter, a three-year-old daughter who's taken away by a group of fundamentalists, um, but also the search for a, um, a search for freedom in a country or a world that is gripped by fear and, um, and politics that is inherently very divisive in its premise and philosophy. So um, with that as the backdrop, I'm going to first start asking you, Prayag, about, um, you know, you speak of a city where a city that's crisscrossed by flyovers uh, that lead people into these well-curated sectors, the Gupta sector, the Tamil Brahmin sector, the Syrian Christian sector, the Bora Muslim sector. Um, what is the city? Where is the city from? Is this a city you grew up in? Is this the city that you think the city you grew up in is going to become? Where does the city really find its inspiration? When I started writing the book, uh, I was living in Delhi, and then I moved to Bombay uh, pretty much quite early in the writing. And I think there's elements of both those cities in my, in my work. But because I think I've always been very interested in this idea of, uh, in, in India, we seem to have this real imperative towards segregation and towards purity, of course. But, uh, you know, there's kind of in, uh, self-enclosing and sort of, it's, it's, it's to do with privilege, it's to do with economic privilege, but it's also to do with other ideas of caste and other ideas of, uh, you know, your own community. It's sort of, a community becomes a proxy for a very, uh, you know, for very basically divisive uh, divisions in society. And, you know, we, community is a kind of benign word for something that is, that can be quite toxic. And I was very interested in this idea because I find in Delhi and in Bombay, uh, you know, there's people sort of like really retreating behind these walls. You know, I, I felt this. I, I felt this. Uh, you know, you put up walls, you put up colony gates, you put up in gated, uh, yeah, gated communities, and uh, and people sort of the more people shrink behind them, the more people retreat behind them. The kind of the more difficult it is. The outside space becomes more and more neglected, and more and more um, kind of is heading towards a kind of ruin and people are uh, people aren't bothered by this you know and so as i as i as i was writing it, it, that sort of infested the narrative you know it sort of crept into the narrative that i was i was actually trying to write about a woman looking for her daughter and more and more it became about you know this sort of the city became realer realer to me as i was writing right so i was also going to ask you about how leila is really actually um, there are two stories that are sort of, uh, that stories in a sense become one. One is really the search of Shalini for her daughter Leila, but also this sort of powerful commentary on, on politics that is divided by caste, language, community. So how did you kind of, you know, weave these two narratives into one? <laughs> well, it took me a long time. Uh, I think I, because I started, I started off with, uh, as I said, I started off with the story of the mother and the daughter. And then um, I, it's the kind of fiction that I really enjoy reading. Yeah, you know, it has this kind of uh, it, it's is a it's a very uh, is this, like you know if you read J M Quincy for instance, you know he's he's very much about he he'll tell a very personal story, a very human story in this kind of in a world that. And but when you when you're done reading, it's also this 
you know, vast social commentary, that is social comment that he'll make, you know, about South Africa, about whatever society he's writing about. And it's the kind of thing that I really enjoy reading. Uh, so I was trying to do it all along. I don't know if I would have done it successfully or not, but I, that was something that was part of the aim, was not just to tell the story, but also to kind of write about the things that really bothered me about India and, you know, the trajectories that we follow right. that have, have been sort of going down. Um, Deepak, so in a recent interview with Scroll, you said um, Abu Dhabi raised you, uh, New York made you, Chicago freed you, but you still hold an Indian passport. So by virtue of sort of inhabiting the life of an immigrant itself, um, was writing temporary people also a very deeply personal experience? Um, I guess, yeah, because of a, a little bit of background, I grew up in Abu Dhabi, so I was raised there. Um, but if you're raised in Abu Dhabi and you, your parents are Indian, the assumption is you're going to leave at some point. Uh, because you have to, because there's n nothing in place for you to remain. Well, we never knew what to do when we left. There was no sense of storytelling about that. So when I left for the States, um, because my parents took out a loan and I was chasing a girlfriend, mm -hmm. but I told my parents I wanted to study and that's why I went to the States. Mm -hmm. And I landed and I realized that there was so much narrative about what it meant to be from a place. Um, and I didn't have any of that uh, because I didn't know what to do with that. Because up to that point, I thought I was the proper Indian. I went to an Indian school. I went to Abu Dhabi Indian school. It doesn't get any more Indian than that. And then you land in the States and you meet people from India who are having conversations with you about India. And you realize you don't know a bloody thing about India. Um, so, and you don't know what to do with that. Uh, but over time, I realized that these narratives had to exist, and they do. There are other writers who have written it. Uh, the Cities of Salt trilogy is a good example uh, from, by Munif. But I wanted to see what the experiences of people like myself were, and I didn't find much of that. And I thought, maybe I'll try to attempt it. I think attempt is a good word that Prague used as well, because I'm not sure if it's working, but I wanted to try. Um, so in that sense, this is my long-winded way of saying, you bet it's personal. Um, because I wanted something to remain when people like myself or my parents left. Um, some sort of document. So if anyone ever asked, um, what of those folks who were here? And they, oh, no one wrote a damn thing. Um, this is perhaps one thing that they can refer to if it's still being read next year, if not, say, 20 years from now. I'm sure it will, yeah. Um, Deepak, also this word temporary, right, uh, that you use that is sort of uh, a metaphor for a, you know, for a larger sort of thing that you're, the statement that you're making. But really, it sort of um, unifies a host of um, ideas of people who leave behind the comfort or perhaps the discomfort of a home and um, looking for hope. But, um, but this hope is always sort of um, uh, kind of there is also restlessness. With hope comes restlessness. So does the word temporary, in a sense, find genesis in that idea of restlessness in that sense? Uh, th that is the, that's an excellent explanation. I might actually steal that um, b because often I don't know what it is that I've done. Uh, but to address the question or to provide an answer my own way, I've always had a visa attached to my name. Um, so I have an Indian passport, that's right. Um, but I've always had paperwork, whether it's in the UAE, whether it's in the States. And that does things to you because you're always aware of the expiration date. Uh, you're allowed to be here legally until A, B, O, C year. Um, and I, I didn't know how to deal with that. But what's interesting is when I was in the UAE, when I was in Abu Dhabi, where I live now again, um, we normalized it. There was no issue about that because that's what we were. It was perfectly fine being that. The minute you leave and you get distance, uh, and either of you may relate, because I know Prayag's from Delhi and moved to Bombay, something happens to you. Yeah. It's as though a switch is either left on or it's being switched off and you have to rethink what you are, mm -hmm. what your place is in the city that you're going to and are living in now. So temporariness for me was always the act of knowing that you had to leave, that departure was imminent. But you had to figure out a way to stop thinking about departure. Of making it permanent. Of, of making it work. Yeah. Because otherwise you drive yourself crazy. Yeah. So in a way, our parents trained people like me and my sister to understand that we would leave. 
but also figure out how we could play games, uh, pick fights, do grocery shopping without thinking about the day when you had to leave. Because I think it might be a very Indian thing to do, if I could generalize. Um, not to talk about something that's going to be an issue. You just talk about it when the issue happens. But that probably also makes you very malleable in terms of, you know, you've lived in so many different countries, so it or cities, so it probably also makes you be able to fit into the, you know, the context of a country very easily. I mean, it depends on context, uh, because I'd like to say yes, but right now I have the privilege of movement, which most people don't have. I mean, my partner is American, I have a green card. When I was a little boy, I didn't have any of that. So malleability is really about context. When I went to the States, I got to the States two weeks before 9-11. And then all of a sudden, at university, people wanted to know why the Arabs hated the Americans. And they asked me this question. And you have to understand, for an Indian boy to be asked what it's like to be Arab in the States was quite a profound thing. Because in the UAE, I'd never get asked to define the Emirati experience. Because I, I won't be able to do that. Um, but because I was asked that question in the States, I began to lie. I said, well, here's why they hate you so much. Uh, simply because I wanted to, like you said, fit in. Uh, I wanted to relate to a people or to a city. The malleability, I think, is just a consequence of circumstance. I have my father and mother to thank for that. Okay. Um, talking of restlessness, Prayag. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, you know, I just found that there's this sort of undercurrent of restlessness that the reader sort of feels while reading your book, because um, in a sense, you're also, you know, forcing you to, forcing us to, you know, showing us a mirror, and especially on the privileged liberals who, you know, who we lead our lives, which are actually really shrouded in, you know, all concepts of hierarchy and division. Um, you know, I particularly like this um, one of the stories about um, Lela's. Um, Shalini's, uh, Lela's caregiver, Sapna, uh, and uh, Sapna's, um, Lela's, uh, Shalini's friend tells her that she should not be kissing her. And um, it starts playing on Shalini's head until that one night when she goes up to Sapna and, S Sapna and tells her that this is the last time you will kiss, you will never kiss Lela again. I was just wondering, maybe you could um, talk a little bit about it and also read a little excerpt. Sure. Uh, should I read first? Sure, or? please. Yeah. She said, uh, it's uh, this is a little section where uh, the protagonist, Shalini, is remembering back to um, an e encounter with a friend of hers and, you know, this is what sort of unfolds with over dinner one, day, uh, one evening. Our home in the East End one evening, Dips visiting. We sat around the dining table, Lila's dolls and blocks scattered across the polished dark wood. Dipanita was zipping up her handbag, preparing to leave, when S Sapna skit skittered up to us, all of 20, brown eyes shining. Sapna is a maid. Sorry, to give you a little context, Sapna is a maid. Uh, get your toys together, she scolded, mocking. What will auntie think? Faint disapproval on Dipanita's face, a tight smile. This girl is too familiar, she said in English. Sapna was oblivious, helping Lila gather the th playthings into a large, sturdy, sturdy container made from see-through plastic. She's fine, I said. They get along very well. She obviously loves her. Lila looked up to see if we were talking about her. Sapna tucked the container into the crook of her arm. They collapsed on the carpet in the living room, spilling the toys around them. Dipanatha scraped back her chair and stood. You know how to raise your daughter, she said with a smile. But when we were, but when we were at the door, I had my back to the room. She clutched my arm. Look, look, she said. She's kissing her. Look at that. Nose, cheeks, forehead. How can you allow that? What's the problem, I asked. She washes her bum too. That's different. Not this. There has to be some distance, propriety. Who knows what's been in her mouth? She squeezed my forearm tighter, eyes big as a hunting cat. They have so many diseases. Stop all this. Promise me. I'll have to think about it, I said. And I did. What bothered me, I came to realize, was the thought of her saliva on my daughter. I imagined faint, near invisible lines of spit slowly so soaking into my daughter's skin, becoming part of her. That night I told Sapna she wasn't allowed to kiss my daughter anymore. I think uh, when I wrote that section, I was trying to, uh, I was looking at, I mean, it's something, it's a conversation you kind of hear growing up in Delhi, you kind of hear this, you know, that don't let her kiss your daughter, you know, don't let her kiss your child. And uh, I, I, 
you know, for such a long time, it used to, I mean, I did, it never even occurred to me that it was something unusual. And then, so as I thought about it, I was trying to understand what it is that, um, you know, that makes it so problematic for us, this idea of kissing, you know, this kind of, it's, and I think there's a, it's a kind of emotional intimacy that bothers us between this caregiver and the child. And, uh, but more than that, it's also kind of, um, it's also kind of, uh, you know, it's this idea, we have the ideas about caste and saliva and, you know, spit are very linked to those ideas of caste and privilege. And class also. Class perhaps, and caste, yeah, both of them. I mean, they go hand in hand yeah. in India. Yeah. But, um, you know, especially with where, where it comes to things like the bodily sort of excretions, you know, there's very, these ideas are very important to us and they're to do with like, you know, what in, I, I don't know what the term is in Chennai, but in Delhi we used to call it juta. You know, you, you don't drink juta from someone else, and that has something to do with. Yechal in Tamil. Yechal. Yeah, but it's, you know, all over India, this is a very important concept. And it has to do with, I think, uh, what we believe of ourselves and what we believe of this imagined outsider. You know, this, and, that, and there's a huge, this un, sort of insurmountable distance between the two. And should not be, and things like a kiss can, like, uh, suddenly bridge this gap very f in a very immediate way for people. And so I was trying to look at how, like, what the Im emotional impact is, because the one, the one place we invest all these ideas, you know, you can be as liberal as you want, mm -hmm. but you, you, you're sort of illiberal and needless uh, and very protective of your child. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, do, you know, everything else, you can be as liberal and I'm a very nice person, but when it comes to my child, I, I will do, you know, I will, I've got my guard up, I will yeah. sort of yeah. build the boundaries, build the walls, and I was trying to sort of yeah. allude to that, yeah. that, you know, even though Shalini goes through this very horrific experience and has this really tortured life, she's also complicit in, uh, you know, by virtue of her privilege, yeah. she's also complicit in this world that, you know, that ends up destroying her and yeah. destroying her life. We all are actually, in a sense, yeah. I mean, that's what so, I was but, but thank you. It was a very, very powerful section in the book. Um, thank you. Um, Deepak, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, you use this word, um, you know, you use a lot of, um, you know, the book is also very, very exciting because there's a lot of Malayalam. You refer to a lot of Malayalam. You also laugh about yourself. Chapter is known as Chab, Chab, Chabda. Yeah. So um, I'm really curious about um, um, just the whole idea of the Pravasi that you talk about. Um, I was wondering if you could read a little excerpt from that. I mean, I found that as a very, the two uh, references to Pravasi uh, in the book. So if you could. Right. So. Um I'll explain chapter. So for those who speak Tamil, it's not you know, unfamiliar, but I'll use my name to explain this. My parents don't pronounce my name right. So I have a North Indian name, it's Deepak. But they say Deepak, or my mother calls me Deepu. Or my aunt say Deepake, and that's, that's basically me. In Arabic, which I had to learn for 16 years, which I really don't speak, the letter P does not exist. So for friends of mine, um, I am Dibak. It's, it makes me feel very distinguished. Uh, and because the work is a play on language, it made sense that chapter would be chapter, right? And now to the Pravasi question, which is a word that I grew up hearing forever, uh, because that's what my parents are supposed to be. And I'm going to read you from a chapter called uh, Nalinakshi. And uh, this is a grandmother basically talking to an interviewer about what it means or what it could mean. Pravasi means foreigner, outsider, immigrant worker. Pravasi means you've left your native place. Pravasi means you'll have regrets. You'll want money, then more money. You'll want one house with European shitters and one car, one scooter. Pravasi means you've left your loved ones because you're young, ambitious, filled with confidence that you'll be back home someday. And you probably will. For a few weeks every year, you'll return for vacations, but mind you, you return older, blacker, news hungry, before you've had time to adjust to power cuts and potholes, like they had in the old days when phones were luxurious or glued to walls. Someone's gonna tell you so-and-so died, and it'll be a shock because you don't know. And when you go to this person's house to pay your respects, you'll discover someone else has died. And as you continue to see people you know, you're required to see. You'll hear about more dead people. 
Um, Deepak, could you also read that chapter from the Kadakaran? Uh, this. So this is um, a chapter called, or chapter called uh, Kada Shop, Kada Story, Kadakaran Shopkeeper. Below my building is a kada, you know, shop, with a kadakaran, you know, shopkeeper. This kada, you know, story involves him. Kadakaran Moidu is what Amma called him. I called him Karate Moidu because he called himself Karate Moidu because he took lessons for a few months before breaking his wrist after falling from a chair, ending what would have been a promising Karate Moidu career. So now he had his kada, which became his kada, that he turned into another kada karan in Arabinad, you know, Arabic country. All of this, his kada, his kada, that he became a kada karan, became his Arabic kada. That was his vidhi, you know, fate. Wow, that was beautiful. So even though you read it so beautifully and it almost sounds funny, um, there's, this, there's an air of melancholy and there's an air of loneliness that sort of, you know, um, sort of pregnates the book. So um, I wanted to talk to you about this idea of loneliness that kind of, I felt that um, there was a sense of desolation, loneliness that runs through the book. Would you like to talk a little bit about it? I mean, it, it depends on who you're talking about. Now, when you leave family behind, as many of these people do, men and women, uh, you think about home. You don't think about home all the time because, like I mentioned earlier, if you do that, you're going to drive yourself crazy. But when you do, you're in this space where you're not sure what to do. And I'll give you an example of this. I never understood what it was like for my mother and father to live away from Kerala, which is where they're from. And because they'd be afraid of a phone call, usually in the middle of the night, because they'd start panicking, especially my Acha. And to this day, uh, if the phone rings in the middle of the night, it's, it's as though he has to save the world. He j jumps up and, you know, he's panting. When I was in the States, um, when the phone rang in the middle of the morning, like three or four in the morning, the first thought in my head is, did someone die? And it, it's not because, you know, I'm morbid. It's simply because if someone did die or someone was in the hospital, as was in the case of my mom once, there wasn't enough time to go back. You're always aware of time. So, you know, that's the isolation and the loneliness. Or, you know, I've been in taxi cabs where you have a Pathan who's driving or anyone who's driving, really. And nowadays, they're talking to their kid. You know, have you gone to sleep? And you hear the voice of this child and the, and the father is driving me. So he's multitasking. He's taking me to a supermarket and he's putting his daughter to bed, sort of, vicariously almost. That's not loneliness. That's also joy, a ritual, wanting to participate. But it's not perfect, right? So if you look at this book or if you ever end up reading and you think it's all about the pain and melancholia and loneliness, that's unfortunate for me personally. Because it's also about joy, it's also about spaces where you're not sure whether you're supposed to be happy or sad or lonely. But that's, but that's life, don't you think? We have those moments. Uh, my, a dear friend of mine recently became a father. Uh, he was so full of joy and now he's anxious uh, because there's a new life that he can't fully control, right? So I would answer that way. Thank you. Um, Prag, I'm going to ask you about the first chapter of Leila that really, really sets the tone for the book, um, the idea of the purity wall. And I had to actually read it a couple of times to um, finally realize that this is, uh, this is a really, really going to be a very layered book. And, um, you know, so this idea of the purity wall, I was wondering if you could read a little excerpt from it and also talk to us a bit about this whole um, act of cleansing that's sort of going through the whole book where somebody, where this whole council is trying to cleanse people and divide them into these sectors and, you know. I think uh, the idea of purity again comes because it's, it's something that is in our discourse, it's in, our, it's in the way we think about the world, is, you know, we're always, uh, again, in, in the north, we call it, uh, in 
in Delhi, where I grew up in the Northern Belt, uh, sort of the, what what is called the Cow Belt. Uh, you know, you have this yeah. like the Hindi Belt. You have uh, this Shuddhi. You know, it's uh, you see it all over the like, or even this idea of pure vegetarian. You know, like you'll see the restaurants on the side say pure vegetarian. And as a non-vegetarian, I always wondered it's about it. It's a very common you know? concept yeah. in the south of India. I, know, <laughs> I, I always wondered about it because you say, like, what is the uh, how pure do you want? Do you need to be? You know, and you go, you travel around in Gujarat, and you see it all the time. Yeah. And uh, so it was, a, it was a term that always struck me as odd. Maybe because I, I've never felt particularly pure myself. So I've always found. Uh, so I always thought I've always been struck by that term and how important it is to India. Right. You know, t into the way we sort of like people who only eat at a certain place or only eat in a certain way because of because of these ideas right. of purity. And so I began to think of a city that kind of comes apart along these lines, you know, that, that where this idea of purity escalates and it becomes an obsession and it starts to divide the city. And I think in many ways our cities are already like this. In a place like Bombay where I live, uh, you, have, um, you have people, you know, Muslims live in, you have a Muslim building. I mean, when, we, when my wife is, uh, well, she's half Hindu, she's half Hindu and half Christian, so she's another a uh, half breed like me but uh uh she you know but her, she has a hindu last name and when when we were looking for a place to live she uh this was before we were married and we were looking for a place to live and so she sort of went to the broker and you know she uh and this broker assumed that we were hindu you know we were a hindu couple and so he took us around to all these buildings and you know it's a very common experience i don't mean to make a lot of it but uh there's uh you know in, it's really, it really hit home when you know it's like here's a this is a Muslim building, this is a Hindu building, this is a you know, and not just that, it was Gujarati Hindu yeah. and uh, you know Marathi, yeah, 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 it yeah. was it was all very and regimented and planned and you know like the la the the brokers knew, the owners knew, the renters knew, you know what the, what was done and what was not done, and it was all unsaid. Yeah. So it it really sort of when I was writing the book, that really came into the book in a in a very powerful way because I wanted to try and capture what that means you know as as a, as, a, as a society and what it says about us right. so um, i mean it's taken on it's taken on a kind of figurative life in the book yeah. but i think that i was trying to look at what how our cities actually are um, so yeah i'll read a little bit uh, purity one is the only sector wall that's not impossibly filthy everywhere else the stench is overwhelming it hits you in the stomach but no one seems to be able to do anything. Sometimes you see slummers wading through the garbage, looking for things to sell. A huge cheer went up. Two young men were visible above the thicket of heads, attempting the wall. They wore only white nylon basketball shorts with oilskin pouches tied at their chests, moving with upward pounces at unnerving speed, backs, calves, arms twitching and tensing, bodies bending double and right around like jackknives. One of the men was very dark-skinned, the other had a tuft of hair in the middle of his back. With the tips of fingers and bare toes, they'd get a hold in the minute crannies and ledges between the uneven bricks, swinging higher all the time. The mob hummed with reverence. How strong to leverage their bodies this way, I said. It doesn't seem possible, Riz replied. This sheer face, how are they doing it? Why not? Like those guys who pull giant chariots by themselves with metal, hoods, with metal hooks buried into their backs. Or the Shias whipping themselves to mush. The dark man tensed into a crouch and sprung to a jut jutting brick above. He couldn't grab on. As he fell through the air, he hammered the wall with his fingertips, striking like a snake at its surface. On the fourth attempt, the finger stuck. His shoulder wrenched and his body twisted, but he clung on with a soft, stifled cry. We exhaled as one. He swung like a pendulum from one hand, grinning down at us unflustered, until he found a niche for his other. Extending his legs, he swung them up over his head, so now he was upside down biceps bursting, lank hair falling in perfect glistening straights like granite rain. He took a foothold and pulled himself upright. Relief in the cheering now. Thank you, Prayag. I just have time for one last question. I'm going to ask you this about just the construction of the book because it sometimes seems like, like a large narratives within another large narrative. So. Uh, how did you construct the book and how long did it take you to actually write the book? Talk to us a little bit about form. So um, I identify as a short story writer. And then when I spoke to my publisher about the book and we were discussing the manuscript and they asked me, what is this? 
And I said, why don't we just call it a book? Because I think it's doing certain things that a collection is not. And they looked at me straight laced and they just said, that is marketing suicide. I said, okay, so what would you suggest I do? So let's call it a novel of linked stories, which basically makes uh, the definition of what is supposed to be indecisive. I'm not happy with it, but that's okay. Um, and I mean, I have to respect my publisher's wishes. But it took 12 to 13 years to write, because uh, I'm slow, clearly. Um, and then something happened in 2012 where I was accepted to go to the Art Institute of Chicago. And it's a m school attached to the museum. And you're allowed unrestricted access to the museum. And I've been to museums before, but not frequently as a child. And what happened is, as I'm going through the museum, I'm looking at the way things are hung, paintings. I'm l thinking about navigation. And all of a sudden, things made sense. Because I didn't think at the time that whatever I was going to write was going to hit the market and everyone would buy it and I'd be the greatest writer that ever lived. Nonsense. So I could play. And because I was at the art school, everyone wanted to be an artist and I wanted to try and write. I was in an atmosphere in a space where people were making things that were breaking all the time. So they were experimenting. So I thought, let me try stuff. Uh, let me try to play with images, um, with the way a novel is supposed to be. And part of it is ignorance. And ignorance is often bliss, because I didn't know how to write a novel. No one had trained me. And I began my reading career, starting with the greats, Sidney Sheldon and Daniel Steele and Harold Robbins. There was no shame in it. Um, and they taught me how to read. But then there was the Panchatantra, Amachitrakatha, and if you follow Malayali films, the good ones from the 70s and the 80s, and the bad ones from the 90s, you think about language, you think about rhythm, you think about music. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to write a book that if someone read it, they'd look at it and go, what in God's name is this? And they would have a certain appreciation or distaste for the author, then that's okay. Because I wanted people to respond to it. Read it and you're allowed to think as you please. I wanted to make that because since I took 13 years for this, God knows if I'll write anything else. I wanted it to count. Um, so that, that's why I, I suppose it operates the way it does. Thank you, Deepak. Um, if the audience has any questions. Hey, thank you, Deepak, for that. Uh, I grew up in the UAE too. I went to the US, so I identified with a lot of what you said. Um, I had um, another observation. I wanted to see if that, that's something you concur with. I think part of the issue with the, I think, underlying melancholy, which I haven't read the book, but sort of came across, was that um, aside from the experiences I had with my own eyes, all the other experiences were, were not relatable. My parents grew up in India, so that was a different sort of experience. What I saw on TV with Bollywood was, was very different. The other most stark thing, which, I'm, which I wonder, which is my question to you, is that there's absolutely no literature of anybody who'd lived the sort of life that I'd, I'd done. because. I think people moved to the UAE in the Middle East, particularly from the south of India in the 70s and 80s. So do you think that sort of experience, at least, I mean, in this specific instance, in the context of Indian, the Indian diaspora in the Middle East, and even more generally as people start moving around the world, starts getting normalized as it becomes, uh, I mean, as it goes on with time, because there's more literature and more things to look back to, rather than you being the first person to look at it through your eyes? So here's the thing, right? Uh, which emirate did you grow up in? Oh, okay, Dubai. So we have an issue. I grew up in Abu Dhabi. Um, but see, here's the thing. I'm not the first. I'm the first writer to be published a certain way and to be acknowledged by certain people. There have been other books, and this is important to state. I've been luckier than most. There's a book of poems written by Andre and Afis Saheli. It's called The Promised Land. Uh, and it's about his experiences of growing up in the region as well. But you're asking about something super specific, which I'll try and address. Um, yes, if you watch Malayali films, they romanticize the Pravasi experience. Um, if you look at articles or essays published in The Guardian, New York Times, a lot of it is relevant. But there's this need to always talk about labor a certain way, right? Um, and I was always interested in the simple things, the banalities of life. Um, I wrote something for The Guardian recently about me and my mates playing really bad football or soccer in Abu Dhabi once a week. Those stories are important. Stories of our parents' generation as they return to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever they came from are important. And you're saying the Indian diaspora, and I'm going to disagree respectfully uh, because we're both allowed to, right? 
I don't identify myself as the sort of Indian my parents wanted me to be. And that's what I mean by vocabulary. In the Gulf, if you're from the Gulf, especially from Abu Dhabi or Dubai or you know, the Emirates or Oman or Bahrain, you don't have a word. Like there you're Indian because you look Indian, right? We don't have hyphenated identities like you're allowed in the States. In the UK, assimilation has taken place over decades. That word will come. And it's not going to be a word where people are going to go, oh wow, that's fantastic. It's just going to be a simple word where people can say, I'm from Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Muscat or Riyadh or Jidda. This is what I am. That will take time. But I can guarantee, because I know some of these writers, that they're writing the books. The books are going to be published. And they're also visual artists, like Raja Khalid Lee, etc., etc. That will happen, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, hello to both of you. Uh, actually, I, what I find common in both uh, these texts is there's a certain fragmentation of identity in the sense that uh, in Leila, for example, while these uh, larger identity is fragmented into very specific sectors as is written in the book, and whereas in temporary people it becomes, I grew up in Saudi Arabia as an NRI, NRI and you know, we lose our Indian, a larger Indian identity, which we sort of like in this uh, limbo between the uh, kind of communities that we grew up in and the Indian, larger Indian identity. But there is a certain fine line between that sort of uh, very separated identity that is written in, in Leila and this sort of collective identity that we sometimes crave as this sort of uh, diaspora. So where do you see that fine line? How do you see that fine line, you know, uh, forming our identities? Prayag, would you like to respond to it? I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think especially with identity because you know it's so integral to our sense of self it's important we we need that we need that kind of you know to put ourselves in some some kind of category but as you know as an immigrant as someone who's lived this lived through an immigrant experience would be able to say much better than me possibly is that identity is definitely a fluid thing you know it's you're never one thing and the you know it all depends on where you are I mean, suddenly I come to, even the small thing, like I come to Chennai and I suddenly feel like I need to explain what happens in North India. You know, it's so silly because I don't know anything about North India uh, any better than other people. But, you know, it's when uh, it depends on who you are and where you are. You know, it's always sort of changing and fluctuating. And I mean, when I went, uh, I was also in college in America, actually. And when I went to college in America, suddenly these ideas of, you know, India became so important to me and representing India in a certain way and, you know, Indian culture in a certain way and uh, things that I never considered when I was in, in India itself. You know, in India I was always looking outwards. I was always looking at, I was, I was getting inspiration from British writers or whatever, you know, like British culture or American culture and then I went abroad and suddenly Indian culture became, you know, representing it in a certain way became important to me. So I think that it's, it's interesting because for, as a, on a societal level we're always trying to place people in categories and that's kind of what my book is about. Uh, you know, try and fix fix an identity upon someone, but in uh, in actuality, we're never one thing. You know, it's always it's never a unitary thing. It's always changing. It's always progressing or whatever, progressing or regressing or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm w I'm with Prag on that. Yeah, you, you clap and then I'll. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much. In a few hours, we will have the winner of the Hindu Prize. So do please stay back. Are you guys nervous? Excited? Take that. Very nervous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.